Well, first off, thanks everyone for coming to the session. I appreciate it. it's early in the morning, and if you had a Friday night that was in it like mine, you're probably still feeling the effects of it. My, my name is Simon Barnes. Um, some of you I already know, um, and some of you hopefully will uh, keep in touch post this event. I'm a principal consultant for a company back in the UK called Riverlight. We are a Citrix, Microsoft, VMware, you know, provider, consultancy, you know, pretty much the same stuff as a lot of you guys do. Um, my particular background is mainly in anything Citrix, and in particular, recently, it's been Netscaler. So, what the session is all about today is going to be providing you guys with, um, I guess, some of the pain that I've suffered over the years, so you hopefully don't have to suffer that same pain, and just real life, you know, things that have happened. So, if I can make your lives easier, then I'll be happy to. So, some examples of work that uh, I've really liked myself have undertaken 4,000 seats of Zen Desktop and Netscaler for large London councils. We do a lot of work for Citrix Consultant Services back in the UK. So, you know, we, uh, we certainly get to travel quite a bit, should we say. Uh, I'm also a Netscaler subject matter expert. So, if you sit in the exams now and you're complaining that they're really difficult, and I've done my job, if you sit in them and you think they're really easy, then someone else writes those questions there. <laughs> um, and then on the back of that, we've also helped write the coursework. So, um, you know, hopefully everybody sees the value of that. After, after this event, uh, I'm going to be around for a bit. So, if there's any questions or anything that we don't get time to cover in here, you know, just come and grab me, and all being well, I'll be able to answer them. So, as I, as I mentioned, this is really about real life scenarios, you know, rather than, uh, you know, going across the Citrix website and reading how everything should work. This is how it actually happens. The documentation that Citrix provide, as much as I like them, is confusing. Uh, and in some instances, personally, I believe it lacks clarity. Anyone ever tried to research GSLV and find a clear answer on how to do that? <laughs> close, close to impossible. So throughout this, there'll be tips and tricks. And then hopefully, at the end, if we can fit it in a QA, and a or if not, you know, just uh, coming across me afterwards. So what we're going to do is, um, there's probably varying levels of, of Netscaler skills in this room, so just going to do a quick refresh on some things that we quite often get asked. So Netscaler comes in three editions, VPX, MPX, SDX. The VPX is uh, a virtual client that runs on uh, the two main hypervisors and Zen server. <laughs> so it's uh, with a Citrix town to it or not, it's, it is ideal for many environments. If you're just using it for XML load balancing, protecting the old website, you know, go for this. You tend to outgrow this um, as you scale outwards. So you know, you start doing lots and lots of SSL, and you want to handle large numbers of users. Then it might be worth looking at an MPX. The, we commonly see these deployed for access gateway functionality as well. Anyone who's used the new access gateway VPX is using Netscale. Uh, the old style access gateways is no longer. Citrix, when I first wrote this presentation a few months ago, Citrix's documentation said it was great for up to 500 users. They obviously since changed their mind and knocked that back down to 300. Um, but as it mentions at the bottom, Barry has written a particularly good article on actual numbers. Realistically, over 500, yeah, possibly even you know, heading towards 1,000 or more in some instances. It's, it's not one size fits all and it's very difficult to benchmark, but like I say, the most cost effective, very easy to deploy, you download it straight onto your hardware browser and you're away. The only drawback with it is SSL offload. For anyone who's not familiar with SSL offload, it is the ability to take encryption and decryption from the server in the back end that usually does it, like your exchange uh, OWA server, and pull that forward onto the next scaler. And as you can imagine, because it's not Windows based, it's very, very quicker to do it on something like this. The VPX doesn't have anything to accelerate it, so it's all CPU based. So if you've got a customer, or you know, internally someone says they want to massively accelerate SSL traffic, the VPX might not be the best way to go for it. This is what we see still see commonly deployed, and we, you know, we deployed a lot of these still. Physical appliance, we sold based on throughput, so how much throughput does the customer need at any one point in time, or as it says further down, HTTP requests and SSL requests. 
microphones. All of you know those things. Citrix have a matrix, and it couldn't be easier to pick your product. The only things that you need to be aware of with these is some of them have a single power supply. So, as you can imagine, you put these things in in the middle of everything, <coughs> you need to think about some sort of high availability or splash of cash and buy the more expensive ones with two power supplies. Where they really come into their own is for anyone who uses lots of SSL. So they have a dedicated card in the Netscaler with dedicated CPUs for all encryption and decryption to massively speed this up. So if you've got a, a customer who runs a, a web store, for example, that handles a lot of transactions, this is typically what you'd see. Anyone familiar with any of the betting companies, they typically deploy lots and lots of these in front of all of their web services. And the last one, SDX. A, a lot of people are still confused as to what these are supposed to be for. Um, the original aim was to take the sort of top eight Netscaler models and to make them actually multi-tenant capable. Now, some people would argue and say that NPX is multi-tenant capable. With SDX, what they've actually done is they put Zen server on it, um, good or bad, depends on your opinion, and you can then carve up virtual instances of Netscaler. And a lot of people come to us and they say, well, why can't I just buy lots of VPXs? Surely, you know, that gets me the same thing. This is easier to manage. It comes with typically fiber as the connectivity, so very, very fast, um, you know, sort of 10 gigabits per second. And SRIOV, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this, but there's still a few people that have never, never come across it. SRIOV will allow a virtual machine to entirely bypass the hypervisor and get direct access to a network card. The, the benefits of that are, you know, it performs as good as a physical. And again, they can accelerate SSL. What Citrix don't often tell you is that you need to buy license packs. You don't just buy an SDX and you can use you know, 30, 40 of them. It comes with uh, you know, somewhere between two and five and then you continuously buy new licenses. Yeah? <coughs> Sorry? The minimum five. I think so, yeah. And then you generally buy five, 10, 15 volt on bolt ons. But yeah, it is it is cost effective. Um, and different levels of the SDXs have different capabilities. So the next section that I want to talk about is networking. Most people uh, who have kind of loosely fallen into Netscaler don't come from a networking background, myself included. Uh, that might be hard to believe. Yeah. But um, what tends to happen is that people approach this with a sort of Zen apps and desktop mindset. You know, we've all done it for so many years. This definitely can't be easy. And then you have a go at it, and then you see a very, very angry side to networking people. So hopefully this is going to make a lot of this clearer. And if there is anyone in here that's a networking expert, I do apologise if you get offended by anything that's about to come up. <laughs> time and time again, people will come up to me and say, yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, we work with a lot of partners across the UK um, where they will ask us to perhaps help them out on big projects. And you know, we speak to their teams and they say, right, yeah, installation, just uh, we'll, we'll give you the box, you can get all that done in the day. It's the easiest part, right? No, I couldn't disagree more. The minute that you get the networking piece wrong, it's going to A, take you a long time to unpick it, and B, it's almost impossible to change afterwards. Right? Once this box is in production, you know, it's difficult without high availability or something to get done something. Some typical examples of things that we see where people get it very, very wrong. Poor performance. I'm sure there's people here who have probably, at some point, plugged the cable into something, left the NIC on auto, and then the network administrator at the other end has set that to a fixed speed. What you then get is half duplex and a whole world of pain. High switch CPU utilization. This, this is a common one. And I think this is something that happens so much that when we're writing the exams for Citrix, we actually end up writing about five questions for the course of that alone. Uh, and we've got a case study on that coming up later on in the, in the presentation. Zero network connectivity, always my favourite one. Someone configures up a, a Netscaler appliance separate to where it's going. You know, typically a lot of businesses now take advantage of Colo, and people like myself as an IT consultant, we were not always allowed in there, so you have to configure it up and then send it. You ship it, it gets to the site, they plug it in, and you know it doesn't work. The network config is wrong, you've been told the wrong thing. 
and then what, it's sitting in the data centre about 100 miles away from you, uh, and you're trying to talk someone through it on the phone using a console cable. So nobody wants to face that on a Friday night. Incorrect network access. Again, generally it's you either assume or you've been told the wrong information. Dealing with a lot of the network teams I've dealt with, it's usually you've been told the wrong information. And the biggest one, and we see this time and time again, we, we go into a lot of companies to address issues that other people have caused, which I, I quite like, but it tends to be a bit hostile. Loss of faith in the solution. People are so quick to lose faith in something, but to regain it is, is a massive, massive effort. Anyone who's ever done a, a Zen app or Zen desktop project and you've handed it out to the first batch of users and their logon takes two minutes or all their applications crash, the next time you ask them to test it, they're not so receptive, right? Exactly the same with this. You tell, every, you tell people this is going to, you know, you spent a lot of money on this, this is going to transform the way you do things. You put it in, you get a problem, you know, you need to think ahead. And more and more and more is networking. So, tips to make this work. Buy the help of the network team, whatever it takes. Yeah? You know, whether that be uh, take them out to lunch, absolutely anything you can do to get these guys on side. We, we actually invest so much time in just trying to get the network team involved. 90% of projects I go into are initially Zen app and Zen desktop based which means that the, the Netscaler piece has not been asked for by the network team. So when you turn up there and you say, oh yeah, I've, uh, I just need to rack this and connect this up to your network, can you do this, this and this? They're generally not very receptive as they've not been involved. So we, we would spend half a day to just educate. You know, I'm sure a lot of people here know that Netscaler is much more than something for Zen App and Zen Desktop. That was never, you know, when it first was released, that wasn't its sole purpose. You can balance load balance data centers, you can protect applications from hacking. There's all sorts of things you can do. And we just invest a bit of time to sort of educate them on that. And if you can get those guys on site, easy sailing. One of the biggest projects we actually did um, was for 8,000 users across two sites in London. And we actually ended up spending almost two days with the network team just talking about what it can do, could do for them. Which consequently was just and, you know, it ended up being more, more, more constantly. So, I like those sorts of things. Check the rules for connecting devices. Again, I, I would strongly advise that you sit down and you speak to someone about this. Speed and duplex. I still go to places nowadays where you cannot set anything to auto. You know, typically that is someone had a bad experience once. So, you know, you plug your netscaler in, you've left it on auto. They set theirs to 100 meg full. It's going to be chaos. You know, things are not going to work correctly. Zero or limited network connectivity. And I know it sounds daft, but we have seen this time and time again. My personal favourite: switch capacity. So you buy your nice shiny Netscaler, eight network ports on it typically, and you, you know, you sort of talk to systems admin guys. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll use all eight network ports, and you get to site and they've got three network ports. Or they buy a box with fibre and they have no fibre switch. Honest to God, the, these things happen. <laughs> so, if you want to use two switches, make sure they've got ports in both switches. <coughs> Management restrictions. This seems to be more and more common now. Um, the network team are the only isolated network within the entire infrastructure that can access a management IP range. So, uh, I've been involved in a couple of projects where we've worked with systems admin guys, we put the box in, configured it up, and then I can no longer manage it short of going and begging the network team to allow me to sit in their office for a bit. Learn that one first, because otherwise you're going to be pulling your hair out as to why all of a sudden you've lost access. Plan, plan, and more plan. Before going to site, we'll have so many conversations with different people to make sure that we understand their topology, what they're trying to gain out with it, what their restrictions are. I'll give you another good example. We went to a, a very, very large shipping company in London and they said to us, yeah, we love everything about it, we really like to use uh, four interfaces. Okay, fine, you know, we do it all the time. So we get there, we do all the config, we sit down with the networking team, here's what we've done, we need you to do this. Yeah, yeah, we love that. Uh, we now need to spend 10 grand getting our switches upgraded because it doesn't support LACB, which you can imagine how old their switches is if that was the case. But, you know, and then everything holds because, you know, people get panicked about using a single interface. So, even the simple questions can save you a day. 
Um, this, is, this is always a strange one for me. I've never seen people as protective about something as networking people and IP addresses. I know the external IP address range is running out, but you would believe with the way that they act that the internal ones are like gold dust as well. We make a point to send a, a checklist to a customer ahead of time that says this is the number of IPs that we'll need um, and here's what we're going to use them for. Because you know the amount of times I've had to fill out a form to ask for an IP address, it's no joke. So request those in advance. Change controls. I'm sure if many of you work with significant size organisations, you've been uh, subject to this many a time. You turn up there, um, I did a job in London at the middle of last year, turned up there, had everything there, right, sat there with the network team, this is what we're going to do, here's our plan. That's brilliant. Can you just fill out this change control form? Yeah, no problem. This is on a Wednesday. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, we'll submit that to our change board, they meet next Tuesday. And I've been booked there from a Wednesday, you know, for a week. So, you know, by not knowing the change control procedure, you can, you know, either seriously burn time or get caught out. Alternatively, what that customer actually did is they did what they call a retrospective change. They made the change and then we just filled out the paperwork after. I've seen that so many times. So if you can get all of this information, I can guarantee you the first two days of your install will just go smoothly. And like I say, if you can get the buy-in from the network team, when you hit a the snag, they'll be willing to help you. If you don't get the buy-in, then they'll just punch a few buttons and tell you it's not their problem. I'm not trying to stereotype network people if there are any. <laughs> you are all helpful. <laughs> the other thing that when I, when I first started out on this, uh, you know, this sort of piece, as it were, um, I, I'm amazed by how the same technology can have so many different names. Now I know Citrix are good at that in their own right, but networking is probably just as complicated. Let's say there anyone else. We call it LACP. The times that I've talked to the networking guys about LACP and they've looked at me like I'm some sort of madman and led me to question myself whether I was right. These are the common things. You know, I'm not going to read them all out to you. They're there. Um, so just be aware that what they call it and what you're calling it, because I've had these odd conversations where you know I'll say LACP and they'll say something else back to me, and then we'll just sort of keep talking but still using our different terminologies. Just be aware, they're not trying to be difficult, they're just trying to talk in a language they understand. This, uh, this presentation will go out to everyone as well, so you'll be able to get a copy of these. So, you know, these are, they seem very, very simple things, but I can honestly guarantee you, without these, you're just going to be wasting your time for the first day. This is a slide that generally we do and it divides the room. 50% of people go, well that's the most basic networking thing that you need to know, the different types of switch ports, and the other 50% of people who have only done Zenap and Zen Desktop think that's something that networking guys know, I don't need to worry. There's two, in, in Cisco speak, there's two types of, mainly two types of ports. There's an access port and a trunk port. If you understand these, then when you actually come to deploy a Netscaler in any sort of complicated environment, your life you know, it's going to be so much easier. And if you can hold a conversation with the network team for long enough to just get this across, you'll sail through. So, an access port is what I like to call a standard switch port. Back in the old days, we all just had one flat network, right? You know, 192.168.1. something else. We had one switch and we plugged the network cable in. That is my definition of, a, of an access port. It's literally a port in a network. Easy. And this is the one that confuses people. A trunk port. I still go to places now where uh, people have bought a physical net scaler and they've isolated eight VLANs using eight cables. Now you can do that, but that's not really the best for resiliency. A trunk port. Everyone here has probably heard the terms VLANs, tagged VLANs, dot one q at some point in their life. In essence, a small tag is added at the front of a packet as it leaves the net scaler. It hits the switch, the switch strips the tag off and drops it in the network. That is the most basic information I can give you about that. And the thing to remember is, this switches don't come set like that at the box. So don't ever just plug it in and set all your VLANs based on what you've overheard someone say, yeah, yeah that's VLAN 22. You need your networking team to actually configure the port. So again, Try and get them on side early on, and this will all be a lot easier. So as you can see the diagram here, VLAN 2, 
the green one hits the switch, the tag will be removed, and then it will be within this subnet here. Yeah, nice and easy. Well, you don't even have the words actually do. Yes, I have. I have one slide coming up. <coughs> Good man. No, no, you're fine. Because we get that a lot. Okay. And this is one thing that confused me, even me, in the beginning. Uh, coming through, coming at it from this kind of weird hybrid network angle. A channel, LACP, Ethernet, uh, Ether channel. Even. Citrix, uh, we, we had a support call open with them for a customer once, and even they struggled to explain the different types of uh, ways that you can achieve this. The idea about connecting multiple interfaces to one switch, resiliency and throughput. You know, for some, you can buy a Netscaler that will go way past one gigabit per second of throughput. If you connect a single interface, you know, you've become the limiting factor there by using one cable. Now, my personal favourite of this is, again, where people don't speak to the networking team. So what they do is they configure it up and then they just plug it in and then wonder why it doesn't work. Uh, time and time again, you know, we, we've been involved and someone said, yeah, I, I decided to use LACP or Ether Channel, you know, whatever you want to call it, did all my configuration and the whole thing has just gone down. And you say, okay, so um, what did your network guide do? Well, you didn't do anything, this would just work. Yeah, okay. So, at, at the bottom it says there, this is the Cisco terminology that most of the time when we deal with people, we just say to them, we need an Ether channel group, and can you set the ports as active? And generally that's enough of a conversation that I can get through without getting too dragged down into it. The next data piece is nice and easy. You know, you can do it from the GUI as well, but with two commands, we can literally add a channel, aggregate a link one, two interfaces, and each interface is a gig. At the end of that, they work active active. And if a single interface fails, they will continue to function. You can actually configure it so that if one interface fails, it actually fails over to another node if you wish. But you know, it's pretty unlikely you want to do that. And then again, we can use VLANs on the channel. Yeah. So most of these kind of early stage configuration bits are really driven by the network guys. So, like I say, get them on side, your life becomes so easy. Neil made a good point. Next day of VPX, we get asked about this one a lot still. Due to the way it works, it goes through a hypervisor. You can tag the VLANs all you like, but by the time they actually get to the NIC, NIC port, they're gone. So people often think, right, well, okay, so I can't use VLANs, I can only deploy a Netscaler within a single subnet. That's not the case. We all know how to, uh, you know, whether it be VMware, whether it be Hyper-V, Zen Server, we all know how to add VLANs onto a virtual switch. Do that, and then just keep giving Netscaler NICs on each virtual switch. And then you can associate the IP address ranges to Netscaler. But again, this is something that is still, uh, I don't think it's made as clear as it possibly could be. Um, and certainly if you look at the forums, it's still a common question. <coughs> but there's a maximum number of interfaces for a VM. And maybe you, yep. you hit that, uh, that, that border, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you could, depending <coughs> on your, your platform, and you could yeah, definitely breach the number. Do you have experience in um, getting the, the VLAN um, trunk to the VM? It's, it's an article on the knowledge base uh, telling that on, on Zen server so that um, the tagging is done by the VM in general but here in, from the Netscaler VPX. Do you have any experience? No, I, personally I already only have done it where you add more NICs uh, based on the, the V switch doing the tagging as it were. Mm. Okay. So another thing that's really important is HA. This is uh, one of my favourite things to employ because it really couldn't be much easier and it just adds in massive resiliency. It works in an active passive mode and you don't need to buy a license for this. So if you bought two Netscalers, then you, know, you might as well deploy it. The only downside is that you actually need to buy two Netscalers. You can't just, uh, you know, as you can with other systems, license the active one, unfortunately. You can't mix and match a VPX and an MPX. I've seen people wish to do that before. I mean, you know, for disaster recovery, maybe that would be a, 
a good option, but unfortunately they don't commit it. In, in essence, HA is, is very, very simple with Netscaler. As you see in the diagram, the request hits a virtual server. And a virtual server, for anyone who's not familiar with Netscaler, it's basically an IP address and a port. The request hits that, and then it will end up on one of these Netscalers. They're constantly just exchanging heartbeats to make sure that the other one is there. In the unlikely event that we lose a Netscaler, and let's be honest, if it fails, it's someone's broken it as opposed to it's failed. I'm sure we can all agree there, Zilli. <laughs> The virtual, unless they obviously produce a firmware upgrade, then that's anybody's guess. The virtual server moves over to the second Netscaler, and there is something that happens called GARP. And without going into this in too much detail, the way I like to walk through this is it basically shouts out and says, I now own every one of those IP addresses that was on the other unit. And then 99% of the time, that works perfectly. However, on Cisco switches and other things, you can actually disable. Um, GARP. So if you do a HA failover and it stops working altogether, can't speak to your network guys. I tell you, they, they break so much. <laughs> so once once that moves over, user connections just move over onto there. There is no automatic failback, and that's something that people quite often ask. Well, you know, when I bring the primary one back online, will it just fail back? No, it doesn't. When a failover occurs, users need to re-establish their connection. Uh, unless they have something where you know it's happy enough to wait a couple of seconds and re-establish. So you know if you're um, connecting to something that's an SSL tunnel, you might get a momentary hang when it cuts over and then refreshes. So it's really the delay is the switches updating their their MAC address. Again, like I said, if I can blame something else on the network team, I'll do whatever. But it's not 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 really a stateful failover. So there's no no mirroring of session tables or things like that. It's yeah, the uh, there's a mirroring of persistency tables. Yeah. So if when you do load balancing on a Netscaler and you have a virtual server and then behind it two services, the persistency information is synced. So if you get directed to server one and I get directed mm -hmm. to server two, when it fails over, that persistency will remain. Okay, but, but no stateful failover in terms like uh, firewall vendors use this term. Okay. Um, they, they say I have two units and uh, even if you're downloading a big file, you just put off one. And because the, the session tables are mirrored, uh, it just works with, uh, with the second uh, client. Yeah, I think, I think it definitely sounds like the same sort of thing. Definitely persistency information is synced between A and B. So in terms of what's happening behind the Netscalers, that will be maintained. But mm -hmm. if you're downloading a file, you know, there, I suppose potentially that might pause, pause for a minute and then re-establish connectivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you do a Netscaler failover, you're talking maybe one drop ping, if it all goes swimmingly first time. But um, yeah, it, you know, perhaps we can always pick that up afterwards if you want to discuss that further. <laughs> so HA tips. Um, when we were actually writing the Netscaler courseware in, in the States, someone actually mentioned this, that they'd actually done this the wrong way. So what happens is, you get two Netscalers and you think, right, I'll just do all my configuration on the first one. When you add them to a HA pair, the second node pulls this information from the first one. Now, what can happen is, if you do not set the correct node as secondary, then your first node will get effectively set back to factory default because the information goes the wrong way. I've never done it, thankfully, but I have seen other people do it and waste a lot of time. So, it's nice and easy to do, literally open up the next scanner, HA, there's an option there. If you don't use some of the interfaces, turn off HA monitoring. So, if you've got interfaces that um, are connected or are disconnected, then HA monitoring can possibly kick in and cause constant failovers between your infrastructure. I've only really come across this sort of once, thankfully, but um, people seem to like to tailor make their SNMP alarms and turn off certain things. <coughs> um, I have seen it where someone has turned off the state change HA, H, uh, SNMP alarm. So you need to, if you don't use SNMP monitoring or syslog or something like that, you definitely need to. Because in the event that you get a HA state change warning, then it's definitely something you need to look into. 
you can have a scenario where you can have two unhealthy nets failure units and HA failover can occur and they both go secondary. So if you're not monitoring it, you definitely need to stay on top of that alarm at the very least. So another thing as well that people are generally not that familiar with is something called ink mode. So typically when you deploy Netscaler and HA, you assume that they pretty much probably sit next to each other in a rack. They have exactly the same configuration. In reality, that's not always the case. If you turn on ink mode, then what it means is the network configuration is not synced between the units. So you might have a, a unit in sort of subnet A with a certain range of IP addresses that is different to the unit in subnet B. So by using ink mode, you stop the network configuration from syncing. And they can hold separate IP addresses. Again, it's not something that you come across very often, but just be aware that there are other options. So, high availability and testing of changes. People often uh, don't test a change in a high, high availability next day, in my experience. Um, you know, they just think, oh, I'll take a copy of the files, and if it goes wrong, I'll just restore them to both units and you know, we'll be back up and run in, in a couple of minutes. So we have synchronization and propagation. So synchronization is the configuration files <coughs> synchronizing between two. Propagation, if you turn off propagation, then when you issue a command on a primary node, that command does not actually get issued on the secondary. So you can essentially create almost two independent net failures for a very short period of time, obviously, by unticking that. So to, to do a change, turn off propagation, do your change, make sure that uh, you've not been given misinformation, do some pretty repetitive testing, and then you can literally right-click in the GUI and force a synchronization. Nice and easy, right? What could go wrong? We have... Um, so the, the last couple of bits of the presentation just focus on um, case studies, so real life things that we've had to do in one way or another, and uh, a bit of an overview of GSLB. So we'll start with the case studies. Uh, a customer came to us and they said, uh, we've got an environment and we need to do something um, with our disaster recovery. Uh, we run a lot of websites, they are a very, very large, in fact, I think the largest shipping company in the world. Each hour of downtime will cost them around about 50,000 euros. So uh, there was a little bit of pressure on the project, I'll be honest. They used a stretch subnet across two sites. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with that, you can literally stretch a network from one site to the other. Uh, people who either love that or absolutely hate that. This customer, uh, it works really well for. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to centralise their configuration. They wanted to stop managing everything across two sites. Um, and I kid you not, everything has to be perfect first time. So uh, plenty of lab time for, for this one. So rather than give a sort of very high level technical diagram with lots of complicated arrows that doesn't come out looking great, this is roughly what we implemented. So we have a virtual server, an IP address, and a port. The client would send HTTP requests. They would hit that. Load balancing would occur using HTTP monitoring. Again, for anyone who's not familiar with this, Netscaler does intelligent monitoring to make sure that what it's actually protecting is still there. And that's not through ping requests and other such great monitoring tools. This is actual requests that you decide. So, you know, this could be to check that a specific web page is up or that a string is returned. So, in an ideal world, the HTTP traffic would hit these two top servers. Uh, web server 01 and web server 02. What you can do with a Netscaler is you can actually create another virtual server that's non directly addressable. And what that means is it doesn't have an IP address or a port, the Netscaler can talk to it, but me as a user, I don't really have any way of you know, managing to get to that. Okay. Because they use the same subnet on both sites, uh, we had a pair of Netscalers in a HA configuration, and then we just implemented what we call a non directly addressable server. So no IP address that the Netscaler can talk to. It. And then we added all of the service and disaster recovery. Hopefully it sounds relatively simple so far. And then the piece of magic that holds it all together is this, backup virtual server. 
This is uh, something that we use quite a lot in uh, Zen App and Zen Desktop XML protection as well. You know, we the primary ones, but we want the backup ones if something happens. By literally selecting that server, if all of the resources in site A go down, the Netscaler will continue to listen on the IP address and the port, so the clients don't have to change any of their configuration. And that will seamlessly, as you can see here, reroute the connections over to the two units. Now this was for HTTP, but you could use this for just about anything. The principle of it is ridiculously simple. And when we presented this to the customer, um, I, I don't think they could quite believe us. A lot of other people would pitch GSLB and all sorts of other complex methods using rewrites and you know, things that they don't need. I'm a big fan of keeping it simple because at the end of the day, when I leave, someone else has to look after this. Or, you know, the more complex it is, the more difficult it's always going to be. And again, if anybody wants to talk about you know, the possible things you can do with that, I'll be about for a while. So, a few years ago, I started doing GSLB. And um, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I started looking into it and I thought, well, I'm never going to understand this. Because every time I read an article on the Citrix website, I saw a diagram such as that, which I thought, that looks good, couldn't be hard. And I'd see that, I'd see that, and then I'd see that. I mean, that is, that's something else, that one. <laughs> and I looked at that and I thought, right, I'm not a networking guy, I know a bit about DNS, but this is never going to come to me. Um, it's, it's not as complex as people think. Um, I'm hoping Neil's not going to correct me here. Um, it, don't get me wrong, you're not going to sit down and you're not going to do this in 20 minutes. But it really, once you've got your head around the whole thing, and for me, one of the hardest things was even knowing about DNS, was understanding how DNS plays a part in GSLB. Because people just think it's this sort of, you set it up and then there's this sort of weird black magic that happens. It's not, it's DNS at the heart. So, GSLB. Personally, I find the documentation and the information from Citrix particularly confusing. There's a lot of independent information out there that, in my eyes, is a lot better. And certainly when I was researching it, I use that. But I'll give Citrix their credit. The updated Netscaler courseware is much better. I'm not just saying it because I had a hand in it, but it's definitely much better. Active Active. So this is a common one. We have customers who want to run Zen Desktop or Zen App. Zen App typically more commonly at the moment across two data centers in an active active way. Use GSLB to do that, nice and easy. Up to 32 sites can be configured, so if you've got a global organization, you can use GSLB to make sure that, let's say, when people travel, that they go to the data center that's closest to them. Um, and again, this is something that um, from Citrix events that I've been to, and they talk about that, and they say, yeah, all you need to do is just configure it up, and then when you travel to Australia, you'll log in, and it'll be, it'll be so quick. One thing I'd say on that is make sure you know where the user's data and email is, because yeah. their desktop might be running in Australia, but if their exchange service halfway around the world, with the best will in the world, that's not going to run well. So, just put a bit of thought into it. GSLB is not the answer to everything. Right? If you have two, two uh, net scalers and a stretch site net, personally, I would use HA most of the time. You know, it's easy. Um, you need an enterprise, well, you can buy a GSLB license. Um, personally, I hope none of you have bought just a GSLB license because it's as expensive as buying a standard license and enterprise. So if you think you're going to use GSLB, definitely buy enterprise. Okay, the answer to that, well, hopefully I'll be able to answer this way, but the answer is a lot. There is a lot of interaction. And like I say, this is something that I struggled with in the beginning. So, this, this would be typical of something that uh, we, you know, I see a lot in the UK. Clients want a single URL to go to, and then they really don't care where that ends up, as long as if the worst happens, it still works. Right? You know, I'm exactly the same. You know, if I go to Google, I don't care if they've got a problem. I just want that search engine to work. Requests are low balance over two data centers. I know it's a basic diagram, but uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning it was the best I could produce on. <coughs> now, this, um, again, depending on, on who you're dealing with, um, we've, we've had a lot of people that we work with that have really sort of struggled to get their head around um, DNS delegation. So what we commonly do is, 
desktop the river like code UK, for example, wouldn't actually exist. It would point to desktop.gslb.riverlight.co.uk and I'll show you a traffic flow example of that in a minute. So what we can do with Microsoft, so this is just standard Microsoft DNS, yeah? So DNS manager there, we can create what we call a DNS delegation. And when you configure GSLB, you typically configure the net scalers to answer DNS requests, yeah? So that when a request comes in, the net scalers can respond with what they deem to be the best location. So you need to make sure that you've added the DNS IP addresses into um, the uh, Microsoft DNS. Totally good. Yeah. <laughs> For example, here we have two net scalers: NSO1.rivlock.co.uk, NSO2.rivlock.co.uk, uh, with some very obscure IP addresses that are in different sites. So essentially, what what we're saying is. We're going to create something called gslb.riverlight.co.uk and we're telling our server for riverlight.co.uk you don't actually know or own this. So when you get a request, send it on to one of these two, yeah? So hopefully you can see this taking shape so far. A request will come in, the DNS server will say, okay, I, I can help you out, but that's not me. It will send it on to these. Nice and easy. We now have a gslb.rivlight.co.uk and then as I mentioned here we've created a record and we've actually pointed desktop.rivlight.co.uk to desktop.gslb.rivlight.co.uk Requests will come into the DNS server the DNS server will then send the request onto the Netscalers <coughs> Behind the scenes the Netscalers will then communicate and send back the IP address that they believe the client should access Here's an example here. Desktop.rivalot.co.uk, two different requests, two different IP addresses. And we, we have customers that use this for multiple thousands of users. And you can literally just sit there and send repeat DNS requests and see it changing backwards and forwards. Depending on how you do it, you could do it so that they go to the closest service and then you run the requests and you keep getting the same IP address back and you think, have I actually done this right? And then you move somewhere else and the request is spot on. <laughs> Quick traffic flow. Request to the DNS server. DNS servers request it from where they see as an authoritative source. In this case. They reply with an IP address of site 1 or site 2. So if site 1 is unavailable, only the IP address for site 2 will come back. The DNS server sends the IP address back to the client, and then the magic piece, the client connects. Some people here are probably thinking that sounds really, really simple, or people are thinking I did not catch a word of what he said. Like I said, I'm going to be about for a while. If somebody would like to, you know, whiteboard it or something like that, you know, come and talk to me and we'll talk about it further. Real life situations. Um, these are let's say, potentially uncomfortable situations that we've been in over time. Uh, I, while working on a, on a project for a, a large company in London, I had a, a guy come up to me and tell me that we need to load balance exchange imminently. So, okay, that's fine. So I said to him, um, you know, give me, give me a port that you want to use. So he said, well, we've got 64,000 ports that it could be on. So, okay, so it's random. So they have an option to set a static port for exchange. Now, I'm not an exchange administrator, but in my wisdom, I probably wouldn't want to do that. I would err on the side of that's how Microsoft said it, I'll probably leave it. With Netscaler, you have an ability to rather than just listen on a port, to listen on any port. Yeah? So when you create a virtual server, instead of putting a number, put a star, and it will pass all the traffic to the back end. You can still do all your clever monitoring and everything, but this way you won't strip out any of the traffic. Upgrade in a single HA node. Do a firmware upgrade onto onto uh, your secondary appliance, and then it will no longer be receiving the configuration from the first one because it goes into a listening state. You can force the file over, bring the new firmware up, and make sure that it works before you uh, roll out onto what was the primary. So nice and easy, but don't do both units at the same time because generally their firmware is spot on. It's a lot more reliable than. Uh, 
Yeah, I was going to go with Zen tools, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know, we uh, we don't generally deploy it on the day of release, but uh, give it a couple of weeks. Uh, command center. This is something that most people, if they bought, well, if anyone who's bought enterprise has already paid for this, but they just never deploy it. Probably because it sits on a Windows server and they think, I don't want to keep adding stuff. Even if you only deploy this for one reason, you should deploy it to automate the backups of your Netscaler configuration. Literally, put it in place, point it at your Netscalers, and then you can set a schedule to pull the Netscaler config down, which it will maintain, and you can also um, set a schedule to uh, whenever a change is done to save an additional <coughs> config. There is a Linux version of Linux as well. Yeah, there's a hardware one coming out as well, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then, just finish up really, high switch CPU utilization. This is something that is uh, is common for anyone who's ever deployed a Netscaler for the first time. They get a bit over eager and they plug all eight cables into a switch. And what then happens is uh, the IP addresses move around the ports and generates a huge amount of what we call ARP. And that is, you know, I've seen network people run out of rooms in anger actually when that happens. So never, ever, ever plug in more than one cable into a single VLAN unless it is set as a channel. The back end connections, the web servers and everything else, they see the SNP address, so the IP address assigned to Netscaler. There's a source IP address for connections. Using the Netscaler request profiles, you can actually change that. So we have customers who need to differentiate between, say for example, the SNP and the IP address that's making connectivity. So if anybody wants to know more about that, then come, come and find me and I'll, uh, I'll um, explain more. This is the last slide, so uh, I promise you can stop listening to me shortly. Tracing, very, very, very easy. There is a um, utility built in called NS Trace, which is just a, a command line utility, and you can apply filters. For anyone who's familiar with TCP dump, the Linux utility, or Wireshark, think of it that way. Um, and there's also a way to do it through the Google, which is very, very easy. And what we would typically do is we would pull that down and then analyze it in Wireshark. You can trace SSL. Um, so you can actually look inside of an encrypted data stream um, as long as you have a certificate. There's a really, really good article on that. And generally, when, what usually happens is people see the word SSL and they just say, well, there's nothing I can do with that. That will teach you how to get away from that. <coughs> That's it. There is one big hint if you, if you want to uh, decrypt the SSL traffic. Mm -hmm. You have to catch the beginning of the session. Yeah. If you if you have an already established SSL session, you have no chance because they're exchanging their um, key just in, in uh, at, at the beginning of the um, mm. conversation. Yeah, and, and that's very important. Otherwise, you sit there and you're going crazy. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point. Um, and I'm sure this goes without saying: the longer you capture, the more the, these files get really big. So you can filter them if you use like Wireshark or something like that to analyze it. Tell me. You can use Telnet from the Netscaler, but what you need to be aware of is when you Telnet, it goes out the management IP address, which is not necessarily the IP address which is communicating with anything behind it. So in my eyes, that's a bit of a false positive. Mm -hmm. Instead, create a dummy virtual server that looks um, at the service that you're trying to troubleshoot, and then at least you'll be able to see whether that's up, down, or flapping up and down. And then pretty much the, the rest is, is exactly as it says. NS -MS MSG is console messages from the uh, shell. And you can use saved versus running configuration. Literally within the GUI there's a button and you can see what's changed. And that's me. So, thank you.